Hey, good morning and welcome. My name is Kyle and I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, if you missed last week and you were here and you were wondering why everyone is raising their hands, then you should go back and listen to last week's message. It was excellent and I didn't deliver it, so I can say that. But this morning we're going to be looking, uh, really, really focusing in on this verse at the end of the reading, John 20. 21. So if you have a Bible, turn there. And if you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles around on the round tables for you. And if you don't know where John is, there's a table of contents for you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And with those words, a revolution was ignited. It changed the course of human history. Today we're going to talk about mission. The word comes from the Latin missio, to send. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. But before we do that, let me, let me pray for us. God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our thoughts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, my, uh, I had a professor in seminary, and he tells a story about how he had a rebellious stint in college. He decided one day to sneak off the campus of Bob Jones University, a very conservative school. And he went to the mall early that day because he wanted to buy something. He knew that if he were to buy it and he were to be caught, shame would ensue. People would look down upon him. Uh, he might even be kicked out of the school, ostracized from the community, but he really wanted it. So he went and he looked both ways and clandestinely he snuck into the store and he, he purchased the reading material. He stuffed it into a bag and then he folded it up and then he stuffed it deep within his backpack and he went straight back to campus, into the dorm, into his dorm room and there he went under the bed making sure that no one was there, people were in class, and there, there he took out his copy of the new international version study Bible that he had just purchased from Lifeway Bookstore. It would have been frowned upon by those at Bob Jones at the time. You see, the church has had a hard time with this idea of translation. Uh, the church has not always liked new translations. I mean, if you think about it, for years the Bibles were all in Latin and the services were all in Latin. And when people started to change and translate, uh, it was met with quite a lot of resistance. In fact, um, when the Bible started being translated into German and English, people died for it. And it's not just from Latin to English, it's also from older forms of English like Elizabethan or James, King James's English to newer vernacular forms of English like my professor's story illustrates. And the church has resisted translation. And for good reason, I mean, translation has inherent risk in it. There are some dangers with translation. Things can get lost in translation. It was a sunny, cool, crisp day in Austria, and I was out cross-country skiing. The hills were rolling, the trees were green, and as I was cross-country skiing, any of you who have done any aerobic exercise in the cold know that your body can heat up pretty fast. And I had on all these layers, and so I just start shedding layer, layer after layer after layer, that by the end of it, I was down to my t-shirt, and, and my Austrian homestay mother, she looks at me, and she says, Kyle, you're taking off all your clothes. And I, I looked at her, and I said, yes. 
And then I said very straightforwardly in German, I translated, I am hot. At which point, she turned red and started snickering, and my homestay father started laughing very, very um, loudly. And so I knew something must have been lost in the translation, but I went on with it, and then we got back uh, to uh, the house that night, and we were having dinner there, and they wanted, for some reason, me to retell the story. And so the father is like, we, you must retell the story. Tell them. And so we're going skiing, and Kyle is taking off all his clothes, and then, and then, uh, and then uh, Imtrod looks at him and says, you know, and says, Kyle, why are you taking off your clothes? And you said... At which point I said, I am hot. At which point my 14-year-old homestay sister spits her food out of her mouth. (laughs) Because apparently the connotations of what I said are not at all what I intended to say. I thought I was saying, I am hot. And in German, the way you say that is you say, it is hot to me. But what I said was, I am in heat. To my late 50s homestay mother, as I am removing lots of layers of clothing. (laughs) Translation is dangerous. Things can get lost in translation. And so you can see why the church has, has resisted translation. I mean, why do it? And yet, and yet, I want you to think about this one fact. That Jesus and all his disciples, his earliest followers, spoke Aramaic. And yet not one book of our New Testament is written in Aramaic. And in fact, if you want to study the best and oldest preserved manuscripts of the New Testament, you need to learn Greek and Syriac and Coptic, but not Aramaic. Now, why is that? Because the message was translated. As soon as they got it, the message was translated. You know, one of the most important events in Christian history happens between Acts 11.19 and Acts 11.20. That white space right there is one of the most important, one of the most important points in all of Christian history. But because, see, what happened is the church was persecuted and they spread to all these areas. And then in Acts 11, 19, it says, wherever they went, they began to spread the news as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, telling the message to Jews. Telling the message to Jews. And that makes sense because the earliest followers of Jesus were all Jews. And they didn't see this as anything other than the fulfillment and hopes of Judaism. It was a Jewish religion for Jewish people. But then verse 20 comes in. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also telling the good news about the Lord Jesus. And that set off one of the biggest controversies in the early church. And here was the question. Do Gentiles, do Greek people, do they have to become Jews? Do they have to adopt a Jewish lifestyle, Jewish laws, Jewish language in order to be followers of Jesus? Or to put it another way, is the message about Jesus translatable? And they got together. You can read about it in Acts 15. And there was this whole council or con- to sort out this controversy. And here's the answer that they came to. They said, no. Jews, uh, Gentiles do not have to become Jews and adopt the Jewish way of life to be followers of Jesus. Or put another way, Yes. The message is translatable. And from there, from there, Christianity exploded. In fact, if we look at church 
history will see that any time the church has been translating the message about Jesus, the church flourishes. And any time it stops translating the message about Jesus, the church retreats. So, for instance, within the first 300 years, the church had adapted and for and adopted the message for Jews, Romans, Greeks, Armenians, Copts, Ethiopics, Berbers, Syrians, Persians, Indians. And that, when Christianity wasn't even a legal religion yet. See, any time the church has translated the message, it has flourished. Uh, We can see that with the Roman Empire. And when the Roman Empire started to crumble, you know what happened? The church continued to grow because they started to go beyond the Roman Empire and even started translating the message for those who were invading the Roman Empire. But then there was a period when the church stopped translating. The late Middle Ages. And during that time, they clamped down, they stifled, they said, no, we're going to just do things in Latin. And what happened? The church stymied until the Reformation. When this crazy German monk started translating the Bible into German, and the message exploded. And this archbishop in England started translating the liturgy into English. And the message exploded exploded. And think about where the message is being most translated now. Across tribes in Africa. Across house churches in China. Northern India. And the church is exploding. You see, wherever the message is translating, is being translated, the church explodes. The church grows. The church flourishes. But where is the church being stymied? Western Europe. America. Where we have things set. Laman Sani uh, is a professor. He's taught at the University of Ghana. He's taught in Edinburgh. He's also taught at Harvard and Yale. He's a convert from... uh, He grew up a Muslim, but he's converted to Christianity... And in his book, Translating the Message, he argues that the genius behind Christian missions, the reason for its rapid spread, is the fact that they continue to translate and retranslate the message. But, but here's, the, uh, here's the, the question. Why would they do that? Well, they would do that because things aren't simply lost in translation. Things are found. Like people like you and me. But still, why did they translate the message when it's so risky? Well, I think the answer gets down to John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. You see, uh, in that... In that verse, Jesus talks about two missions, two sendings. The mission that he has, that he has been sent from the Father, and the mission that his disciples have, that he has sent them out. And he talks about these missions, and they are related. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So we need to look at both of these missions. We're going to look at the mission of Jesus, and we're going to look at the mission of his disciples. First, look at the mission of Jesus. Jesus starts this commission with his disciples, and he reminds them that he has been commissioned, as the Father has sent me. And throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus talks about how he has been sent from the Father. And if you want to understand fully the mission of Jesus, you need to read the whole Gospel. But we get a sketch of it in the earliest chapter in the prologue. There, John begins his Gospel with, once upon a time, And yet he doesn't. No, he begins his gospel with, in the beginning. In the beginning, a deliberate echo of the first verse of the Hebrew Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But he doesn't say, in the beginning, God created. He says, in the beginning was the word. The logos. A popular Greek term at the time and concept The word in Greek understanding meant the logos was the organizing principle, that which holds everything together in the universe. It's that which gives all of life a sense of meaning, and it gives substance to reality. Now, do you see what John has done? 
He has just bridged the two worlds of his day. The Jewish world from which he comes and the Greek world. Why? John's translating. In one simple phrase, he's translating. Why? Because he wants them to know that the one who holds all of reality together, that gives meaning to all of reality, that organizes all of reality, that gives substance to reality, that that one was with the God of Israel in the beginning. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The word was with God. That is, he's distinct from God. And yet he was God. He's indistinguishable from God. He is with God, distinct, is God, identical with. How, you say? How is that? Well, John is not concerned to answer how. He wants us to ask the question, who? About whom does John write? Let's go on. Verse 3, all things were made through him, because it is a him. And without him was not anything made that was made. The word created all things. All things were created for the word. The word defines all things. It gives meaning to all things. And in the word, all things have subsistence. Let me ask you a question this morning, do you feel like your life is meaningless? Do you feel like you lack purpose? Do you ask the question, why am I here? What am I doing here? How did I end up in Santa Barbara? I was talking to a college student at City College last week, and I don't think she was expecting this question, but I said, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Why do you live? What drives you? And she looked, at, like, uh, she looked at me like I was from Mars. But I said, you know, she didn't have an answer to that question. It's not that there wasn't an answer. It's that she had not thought about the answer. But is the question that actually is thought or unthought, articulated or unarticulated, it is deep below the surface of all of us. And could it be that if we don't have a sense of meaning, if we don't have a sense of purpose, could it be that if that's you here this morning, that it's because you don't know the word? Well, how do you know the word? Last night we were eating at our kitchen table, and Pam does something that she often does and that I often do with a three-and-a-half-year-old. She says, use your words. Use your words. You've probably, those of you who have kids, know what this is like. Use your words. That, that is, make that which is inaudible, audible. Reveal your thoughts and expressions of your heart. Tell us what you are thinking. Make that which is concealed, revealed. Use your words. And I heard a pastor make an analogy between that and John 1. Use your words because John says that God used his words. Look in verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. He has made him known. He has revealed. He has translated. And how did he make him known? Well, he he translated him, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's the greatest act of translation in all the world. And it's, and, it's, and it's such a great act of translation that, that he, even, he even takes on a name, verse 17 tells us, Jesus, which was a common Jewish name. If you were to look up in the yellow pages of uh, Judea at that time, uh, there would be hundreds, thousands of Jesuses. It's a common name. A common man. A carpenter from Nazareth. Use your words. God has used his words. But why would he do that? Because it's dangerous, is it? I mean, people could misunderstand, and they did misunderstand, and they wanted to kill him. Why? Because things are not only lost in translation. Things are found in translation. See, why did God translate himself to reveal to us who he is? Look at verse 14 again. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. And verse 18, no one has ever seen God, 
the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. That is that Jesus taking on flesh did not conceal who God was. It actually revealed who God was. Veiled in flesh that God had seen? No, that's wrong. Sorry. I know that's what we sing at Christmas. I know that's what the hymn says. Not what John says. The flesh did not conceal who he was. The flesh revealed who he was. See, here's the Christian claim that Jesus is God's word. And Jesus is the one who reveals who God is. He reveals the very glory of God. So Christians have always claimed that if you want to know God, then the best place to go is to look and to stare into the face of Jesus Christ. God has spoken. He has used his word. But of course, I can hear the objection, and it's a massive objection today, and it's this. Wait, Kyle, and this is the problem with Christianity. This exclusivism, this idea that Christianity presents the one unique way to God, that it has a corner on the market of truth. Uh, that can't be the case. In fact, that's destructive, and, 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 and that is like, that's what causes a strife amongst people, and, and it's arrogant. No, I, I, I think that all religions have a truth, that, that we're all on pass and we're all going up the mountain to God. Or to hear, put it another way that you might have heard it said, it's like, it's like three blind men around an elephant. And one is feeling the elephant and he says, this is a wall that is big and flat. And another one feels it and he says, this is tubular. And another one feels it and he says, this is uh, uh, hard and smooth. And of course, one is feeling the trunk and uh, one is feeling the stomach and one is feeling uh, the tail. And, and you think, well, that's what it is. I mean, we all have our own perspectives on the truth, but we don't see the whole thing in full. Because you know there's a problem with that. There's a problem with both of those ways. It doesn't really work. Let me help you understand why. Because here's why. You know, in order to say that all paths lead up the mountain, you have to actually have been to the top of the mountain and see all the paths. In order, the story of the blind men is told from the perspective of someone who sees the whole thing. So actually, to make those kind of claims is its own type of arrogance. It's its own it's its own way of saying, I have the corner on the market of truth, and I see the truth. I see it all. And maybe you say, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying, Kyle. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we actually can't know all the truth. We can't see it all. So it's better to live with one another in this humility that because we can't see it all, that we just know that no one has the whole thing. And no, we can't see it. But, but that assumes something else. It assumes that God has not revealed himself in a unique and particular way in history. But if God has revealed himself in a unique and particular way in history, then it's incumbent upon us. In fact, it draws us all together to learn from him here. And Christians never say that they have the whole truth or understand all of the truth or that they see the whole elephant. But what they do claim is that they know the one who does. They know the one who does. And it's this man, Jesus Christ. And so here's the question. God has used his word. Are you listening to what he says? Are you listening to what he says? Why would God translate himself? to reveal himself to us. And what does he say when he reveals himself to us? Well, that brings us to really the second reason why he translates himself. To save us from what we are. Verse 4 of John chapter 1 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And in verses 16 and 17 it says, For from his fullness we all received grace upon grace. For law, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Life and light, truth and grace. In him was life. Did you know that as humans, we are mortal, perishable? That is that we can't live in and of ourselves and we cannot live forever. 
But the claim of Christianity is that the intransient one took on transience, that the inviable one took on weakness, that the imperishable one took on perishability. Why? When the Word was made flesh. Well, he did it so that we who are transient might be linked to the intransient one, that we who are weak might be linked to the inviolable one, that we who are perishable might be linked to the imperishable one. You see, the understanding of the atonement, the idea of the atonement, which means at one moment, we think about that in terms of the cross, and right we should, because it is the climax of the atonement, but atonement starts in the incarnation. When God binds himself to flesh. When, that, who is the, when he who is the giver of all life binds himself to those who do not have life in and of themselves. In him was life. Let me give you a picture. You are out on a lake and it is frozen over and you are walking. Why you are doing this, I do not know, but you are. And there's a place in the lake where it's thin. And you fall through. You fall down into the darkness and shock takes over you and you can't swim and there is a gravitational pull and you just sink down into the darkness without any air, the place of death. But someone is up around the lake and they see you and they actually are wearing a scuba diving suit. Why they're wearing a scuba diving suit, I don't know. But they see you and they jump down into the hole and they swim after you. And before they jump into the hole, they actually cut their oxygen tube. They split it so that you can suck on some and they can suck on some so that they can give you life because that air is life. See, in him was life. He attached himself to us. The immortal took on the immortal one took on mortal flesh so that mortal flesh like you and me might live immortally. This is what God did, and, and he did it because things are not just lost in translation, things are found in translation. Things like you and me have been found in the translation of the word. This is why God sent his son. This is the mission of Jesus. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him as the father has sent me this is the mission of jesus but how does that relate it to our mission the mission of his followers which brings us to the second half of john twenty twenty one. as the father has sent me even so i am sending you jesus says see why are you here you don't have to ask that question anymore why am i in santa barbara you don't have to ask that question why am I at this college? You don't have to ask that question. Why am I in this job? You don't have to ask that question. I can tell you why. You are here to participate in Jesus' mission. And I use the word participate very intentionally because John, he uses an intentional word in his um, grammar here. He says that uh, as the Father, when Jesus has sent me, the idea isn't that Jesus was the sent one and is no longer sent. No, Jesus is continually sent. It's in the perfect tense in Greek. It means that it happened in the past, but it carries on. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. See, uh, what John is saying, in other words, is not your mission does not carry on, is not to carry on the mission of Jesus. That is not your mission. Your mission, it's not as if um, Jesus' mission was replaced by the mission of his disciples. No, Jesus' mission continues on and is effective in their ministry. And so what they do is they participate in the one who is still being sent to the world. That's what we do. How? How do we participate in this mission? Well, let me give you three words. Three words to help you understand it. Three words that I think encapsulate it. The first is witness. And we can see this actually encapsulated in chapter 1, verse 15, where there's this throwaway statement in the midst of talking about Jesus where it says, John bore witness about him. Speaking of John the baptizer, John bore witness about him. See, there is no greater word to describe our mission than witness. And witness, it, it, it certainly is not less 
than telling people the truth about what, who Jesus is and what he has done, about informing them about that truth. But it's more than that. It's actually living and embodying the truth of what he is doing in the world and what he will do at the end of time. You see, witness is proclamation and demonstration. Proclaiming what God has done in Jesus Christ and demonstrating what God has done, is doing, and will do in Jesus Christ. We are a signpost of the new creation. And we can't be witnesses alone. Because God didn't come to save us as monads. God came to bind us together in community, which is one of the reasons why God revealed himself in a particular time, in a particular place, so that he might bind us all together. Because if he just revealed himself to me, revealed himself to you, revealed himself to you all independently, then we are still disconnected in our relationship with God. But don't you see, God cares about community. And so he comes to a particular time, a particular place that we might all gather around and meet around that place and tell one another. So we witness. Well, what does it look like to witness, to proclaim and demonstrate? Well, I think that one of the ways we can see it is is in John right here. I mean, he goes on. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he is before me. Now, do you see what John has done? He who comes after me ranks before me. What John has done is he's just shown his weakness to highlight Jesus' strength. He's shown his subordination to highlight Jesus' supremacy. He's shown his inadequacy to highlight Jesus' sufficiency. And that's what it looks like. You see, your messy life, your brokenness, It is not a hindrance to the witness. It is a strength. But of course, to do that, we have to be vulnerable and we have to be honest and we have to admit that we are broken, that we are weak, that we are inadequate, that we are anxious, that our lives are falling apart. Why? So people will focus at us? No, so that we can talk about his strength, his promise, his truth, his grace, his life. Witness. That's the first thing. The second word is translate. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And God did not send an untranslated word. Now, when I use the word translate, I'm not simply talking about translating language. Some of you are thinking, do I need to be involved in Bible translation? No. Language actually is intricately bound up with culture. So we translate in language and culture. And we translate in as many ways and to as many people as the word needs to travel. Wherever, whatever cultural expression that the word needs to penetrate, that's where translation needs to happen. You know, the center of Christianity is shifting, and actually that's always been the case. In the very beginning, the hub of Christianity was Jerusalem. And then it moved from Jerusalem to Antioch. And then it moved from Antioch to Rome. And then it moved from Rome to Constantinople. Uh, And then it moved more towards northern Europe and America. And now, guess what? The center of Christianity has shifted to Africa and China. And and so uh, what that does, though, is creates this dynamic And the dynamic is, because of the shifting center of Christianity, there is always need for new translation and to be retranslated. Some of the places where the church first began are actually devoid, uh, they're void of the gospel right now. And the word must be translated back. But you know, we're in a place where Christianity is waning. But we're also in a place where there's tremendous opportunity because of that. Uh, Timothy Tennant, who's a missiologist, he says, the lifeblood of Christianity is found in its ability to translate itself across new cultural and geographic barriers and to recognize that areas that were once the mission field can over time become the very heart uh, and, uh, and become the very heart of Christian vitality while those areas that were at once the heart can lose the faith they once espoused. That's us. We are in a place where Christianity is waning. But that's actually a place of tremendous opportunity. You know why? There's tremendous opportunity here because 
Uh, and this is not a political statement. Whatever you think about your political views, it is an opportunity for the gospel, all the immigrants that are coming here. And you know why that's an opportunity for the gospel? I know what some of you are thinking, because we can translate the message into their language. And yes, that's an opportunity, but that's not the primary opportunity, because you know the majority of those people that are coming here? They're Christians. They're Christians coming from places where the Spirit is blowing fresh fire. And so we need to actually come and welcome them so that they can blow that fresh fire, retranslate the message back into our culture. So that they can teach us and we can learn from them. So embrace them. It's like this. It's like when I was, um, when I go to weddings, uh, sometimes at the end of a wedding, you know, the bride and groom are going off and, and you light sparklers. Have you ever done this? And for some reason, my sparkler, I always end up getting like the first sparkler and I light it, but I'm trying to keep it from not going and it's cold and windy and then my sparkler goes out. And what I end up having to do is the person who I just lit their sparkler with my sparkler, I'm now having to ask them to relight my sparkler with their sparkler, you see. Well, in the same way, that's how Christian mission and translation works. You see, we initially lit the fire in a lot of places where Christianity has now become the center and the heart of vibrancy. And now they have to relight our sparklers. They have to relight our fires as well. But see, translation is not an opportunity simply because of the center of Christianity shifting. It's also an opportunity, but translation is always an opportunity and always before us because culture is constantly changing. You see, in, in the... The gospel, it must be translated into whatever cultural expressions are around. You say, wait, wait, are you saying like hip-hop culture? Can the gospel be translated into hip-hop culture? Hipster culture? I mean, come on. Yes. Yes. C.S. Lewis once observed how God's condescension in the incarnation justifies reducing scripture to the vulgar. Unliterary speech of the humdrum world, the boldness of the one, he said, begets the audacity of the other. And so whether it's East Coast transplants or homegrown surfers, we translate the message to as many people need to hear it. Are you translating the message? Are you translating the message to, you know, cyclists who get coffee or to yoga folks who do juice press? Hippies, hipsters, boomers, millennials, they all need the message and they all have to have it translated because God's word is not an untranslated word. Parents, are you translating the message for your children? Are you engaging them with the message of the gospel in new and fresh ways? Because the way it was communicated to you is not adequate for communicating to them. The message must continually be translated and retranslated and retranslated. God did not give an untranslated word. What does it look like? It, with so many cultures and so many different people, with so many different opinions that we live around, uh, what does that even look like? I mean, where do you start? Well, you start with whoever's close by, who God has providentially put before you. And instead of uh, retreating and disengaging because it's awkward, because they're different, you engage and you learn and you understand. You know, nobody, nobody who is going to do Bible translation in a new place just starts translation off the bat. They first come and learn the language of the people. You have to learn the language. You have to ask the questions. You have to live with them. And the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. See, translate the word because God wants his life-giving word to go forth. Translate the word so that people can see the glory of God. Witness. Translate. The final, receive. Just after Jesus gives this commission, he says in chapter 20, verse 22, receive the Holy Spirit. And that's no coincidence. Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit because he wants to know that we cannot participate in the mission of Jesus without going out in the power of Jesus. 
And the Holy Spirit is that power, so we must receive the Holy Spirit. You say, well, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? What does that look like, Kyle? Well, it looks like this. It looks like not forgetting the one who goes with you, Jesus himself, and not doing mission without relating to him. It means that we don't share the love of Christ with others without receiving the love of Christ ourselves on a continual basis. It means we don't talk about Jesus being all satisfying without being satisfied in him ourselves. And it means we don't apply the gospel to the darkness in the dark corners of this world without taking a look deep inside the darkness of our own hearts and applying the gospel there. That's hard. It's hard. And to be honest, we're not very good at it. As a church, we're not very good at it. We're good at the theological terms. We're good at Christ died for me. We're good at at being correct on those things. And we're good at, at ethical imperatives that the Bible says. We're good at talking about that. But when it comes to actually lifting up the hood... And looking at the thoughts and motivations and intentions behind our actions. At the idols that are deep within that give rise to the sins. And applying the gospel there. And being honest with one another and asking and inviting one another into one another's lives to do that. To ask the hard questions and to talk about how the gospel is working there. Well, we're not that good at that. I'm not good at that. And that's something that we all need to learn. But it is a gift. It is a gift to learn it, so we need to receive it. And do not doubt that it's a gift. I mean, notice that at the, at the beginning of this statement in John twenty twenty two, he says that Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. That that breath that was sent down to Adam in the original creation of the garden and gave him life, that breath that was sent into a valley of dry bones that gave it life, that breath, the spirit which gave life to our Lord Jesus Christ when he had been in the tomb for three days, that breath is the breath that he breathes on his disciples so that they might have life. You see, Without participating in the mission of God, there is no life. It is a humdrum, boring death. But accepting Jesus' invitation to participate in his mission, to actually get involved in translation and the hard work of having to say like, Lord, help me. Help me not to retreat and help me not to compromise. Help me to translate your message in this gray stickiness where things are lost and things are found. Help me, Lord, because I need you close by, stick close by me as I do this, because that's the only way I can go forward. Lord, if you don't go forward with us, then we shouldn't go. See, when you put yourself in that place, that's a gift, because then you receive life. In him was life. And his life was the life of men. I hope you receive that today. Let me pray. God, I do pray that we would be those who in dependence and in relation upon, in relation with you, trust in you and seek to get the word out in every way possible. That others might know that the world might believe and then they might behold your glory and have life. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.